Oh, Jesus, you are more good than we could ever know in this life. Your work on the cross, your life which proved you to be the innocent sacrifice, your teaching, all of those things, Jesus, were good. They were very good. We know that you are the Savior. We know that you're the Messiah and the coming King. And we worship you and we praise you. Now, Father, we ask that you would grant us your grace, that we would understand your word tonight, so that we can anticipate you, we can prepare for you, we can love you, we can know you. And it is in your name, Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, would you turn to the Old Testament book of Joel? If you need help finding Joel, just find Daniel and turn to the right by two books, and you're there. We are making our way again through the 66 books, so we're most of the way through the Old Testament. Tonight we're going to be looking at the book of Joel. It's a short book, three short chapters, and it is our privilege to walk through those together. Think about this. What comes to mind when you think of the day of the Lord? Do you think of the Battle of Armageddon? This place where Jesus defeats the army of the Antichrist. Or maybe you think about the outpouring of God's wrath during the second half of the tribulation. Or maybe you think about something that relates to God's judgment of future Israel because of their unfaithfulness to him. And when you think about the day of the Lord, what do you think about the purpose of the day of the Lord? As we think about all of those things, we need to keep one thing in front of us tonight, and that is that the day of the Lord is all about the Lord. It's all about the Lord establishing himself. The central figure in the day of the Lord is the Lord. So everything about the day of the Lord has to do with God himself and what he plans to do to exalt his own name. What God plans to do in his covenant relationship with Israel, which includes the judgment of unbelieving future Israel, the fulfillment of his promises to the remnant of future Israel, but also his judgment of the nations at the end of the tribulation. It's all established and aimed at one thing, and that is the exaltation of God and his name. And we're going to be looking at Joel here, and we can divide Joel into three basic categories, three basic parts as we look at this letter, this book tonight. The first involves the foretelling plague that besets Israel. Then we have a situation in which God describes his day of the Lord. Then we have a situation in which God explains how it is that he's going to accomplish his day of the Lord. And the book of Joel is a very brief book, and it has a very brief introduction. And the introduction doesn't tell us very much about the author at all, other than that he was the son of Pethuel. The word of Yahweh came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. And Pethuel himself is not mentioned elsewhere in Scripture, so we don't know anything about Joel's tribal affiliation or his genealogy. But as we read the book, we find out that Joel does know a few things about agriculture, so he might not have been a Levite. They didn't have too much knowledge of agriculture or harvesting. A lot of times when we look at a book like this, we want to make sure we understand the timeline. And there's a lot of debate, there's a lot of discussion, there's a lot of disagreement about the time frame in which Joel was written, whether it was before the exile or after the exile. We know when we get to chapter 1, we'll find that the events of chapter 1 are written in the past tense. So they appear to describe an event that has already happened in a time that's contemporary to Joel. But when we get to chapters 2 and 3, we see the future tense quite often used there. And that tells us that God is talking about something that is coming in the future. So let's bear that in mind as we read. What we're going to do first is we're going to take a look at chapter 1, and we're going to see that God sends a foretelling plague to Israel. And the first thing we need to notice about this plague is its physical devastation. The first thing we'll see in verse 2 is that this is an unprecedented devastation. Joel writes in verse 2, Hear this, O elders, and listen, all inhabitants of the land. Everybody is to notice this. Not only the elders, but all the inhabitants of the land. The elders need to take notice of this because they're the leaders of the community of Israel. And it's their responsibility to oversee the welfare of these people. So it makes sense that they need to look at this. But Joel is careful to write not just to the elders, but to all the inhabitants of the land. 
What has happened is of such a magnitude that it affects everybody. Every single person in Israel will be affected by this plague, and there's not one single person there who will be okay if they just ignore this plague. But we need to notice how unprecedented this plague is when we look at verse 2 at the back end of the verse. Joel writes, Has anything like this happened in your days or in your father's days? Not only does everybody need to take notice of it, but they need to understand that what has happened here, nothing has happened like this for several generations, several decades at least. Israel was dealing with something very, very devastating. Perhaps to us it was something like a 100-year flood or something like that. But not only do they need to understand how unprecedented this is, they need to take this event and they need to tell it down the generations. And we see that in verse 3. Joel writes, tell your sons about it and let your sons tell their sons and their sons the next generation. You notice the repetition there. Your sons, their sons, the next generation. This story is to be passed down from one generation to the next without any real end. And the generations need to know all about this. This really is a massive occasion that they need to know about. So we ask ourselves, what is it? What is it that they need to tell one another about? And it's right there in verse 4 for us. It is a locust plague. Locusts. And for us out here, that's grasshoppers. And they have devoured the land. We see this. What the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. And what the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten. So God sent a plague of locusts to the nation of Israel, and this swarm was massive. And we notice that God uses four terms to describe these locusts. And there's a number of commentators that have various interpretations of what that really means. But the point is that this is an absolute devastation. The leftovers from each type of locust is consumed by the next one, such that what the creeping locust has left, the very last locusts, the stripping locusts have eaten. There wasn't anything left. And when you consider a swarming locust, that tells you that these locusts can fly. And so they have the ability to migrate and move throughout Israel. So this was a very widespread thing. This wasn't just a localized regional problem. And so God has a message to Israel in, in this. There's this massive, massive devastation that has taken place. And his message to them is that they need to mourn. And we're going to see that in verses 5 through 13. And there are several different kinds of people who need to mourn. And this is representative that mourning needs to take place over the whole breadth of the community of Israel. And the first group of people that need to mourn are the drunkards. You see that in verse 5. The drunkard, the wine drinker, he is to weep and wail on account of the sweet wine. The pastime of the drunkard, their intoxicated loitering and idleness is gone. It's all gone. Joel says, awake and weep, wail all you wine drinkers on account of the sweet wine that is cut off from your mouth. The sweet wine has been cut off, literally. It's been abruptly removed from them. What they were so used to, what was always so near to them, has been abruptly and dramatically removed from them. It's been torn away from them. And we see a description of what these locusts is like in verse 6. Joel refers to the locust as a nation, millions and millions of them, all descending on the vineyards of Israel. And verse 7 tells us what they did to the vine and the fig tree. They stripped it, and they cast away and discarded. And you see a reference there to white branches. Those are branches with no bark. We all know that bark is there for the protection of the plant, and without that protection, the plant will surely dry. Die. So the drunkard that is normally appeased by the knowledge that soon again he'll be able to have access to his drink and he can resume his lifestyle, he doesn't have any such assurances here. The deadness of the vine tells him that the reprieve in which he finds his joy will never come. So he is to mourn. But there's a, another judgment against Israel here. God is being very clear. He's not saying absence of the opportunity for drunkenness is an occasion for warning. Instead, what he's saying is, there are a number of you who, rather than loving me, you love what keeps you from true fellowship with me. And for you, the loss of that which you cherish most should drive you into mourning. So Israel was in a pretty sad state. But the land itself is to mourn, and we see that in verses 8 through 10. 
a land that God prepared to be flowing with milk and honey that God intended to sustain Israel through every era of their history. This was to be a testimony to all the nations around them of God's blessing on the people who were uniquely his. That was a huge privilege for the land. But here the land has lost its bounty, and we see it in verse 10. Joel says, The field is ruined, the land mourns, the grain is ruined, the new wine dries up, and the fresh oil fails. So you had these fields that were flourishing, you had grain and you had vineyards. These were all signs to the barren nations around them of God's blessing on his promised land and the people who lived in them. But you see the language that Joel uses there, ruined, mourned, and failed. These people were so steeped in their sin that God has taken away the land's ability to attest to his goodness to those people. So the land is to mourn as well, but then we notice that the farmer is to mourn. You see that in verse 11. And the reason why is that the harvest of the field has been destroyed. Everything that he has worked for is gone. The crops and the wheat and the barley is destroyed. And because of the gnawing locust, every kind of tree and bush fails. There's a list of five different plants there. There's the vine, the fig, the pomegranate, the palm tree, the apple. All of those things have failed. That's the result of the bark being eaten away and that those trees and those plants dry up. So with the absence of the fruit in the field, there's no harvest and the occasion of such thanksgiving and joy to the Lord simply could not occur. And so consequently, the rejoicing dries up among the people who farm that land. But most significantly, we see in verse 13 that the priest is to mourn. It has to do with the grain offering and the drink offering. These were such a big part of their system of worship. And these were no longer available because of the locust. The grain offering was an expression of thanksgiving for the forgiveness of sin. The drink offering provided an aroma which was pleasing, pleasant to the Lord. This was part of Israel's covenant worship with their God. God had given them clear guidance as how they were to worship him, and the locust plague had removed their ability to participate in the worship that God had designed for them in their covenant relationship with him. And at first glance, it might appear that this is just some unfortunate circumstance which Israel needed to recover from, but it really isn't that. Nothing could be farther from the truth. And we see that at the end of verse 13. All of these things, uh, the grain offering and the drink offering, Notice the language, they are withheld from the house of your God. They are withheld. That means that somebody is doing the withholding. God himself is withholding these offerings. He's removed these elements of offerings so that Israel can no longer give them to him. That's how bad it was in Israel. This massive physical devastation which should bring about such great mourning through all the segments of the population is a cause for great, great, great mourning because they're not able to worship God the way that God intended them to worship because God took that means away from them. And Joel explains what Israel or is supposed to do because of this. And we see that in verse 14. They are to repent. There is a call to repentance. Consecrate a fast. Proclaim a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land. That's everybody. Gather them to the house of Yahweh, your God, and cry out to Yahweh. So God's instruction is to everybody. And what are they to do? They're to set aside an occasion and they are kind of come to the Lord's house and they are to come to the place where he said he would dwell and they are to do two things. They are to consecrate a fast and they are to cry out to the Lord. And we know this. A fasting is an outward sign of inward repentance that is taking place. So Israel is to express outwardly the repentance that's taking place internally. God is chastening Israel here. He is chastening them. And he was using their ruined land to show this to them. In verse 16, their food supply is gone. In verse 17, the seeds are drying up in the ground, the very ground that's supposed to promote their growth. There's no surplus food. In verse 18, the beasts are suffering. We notice in verse 16 something that is encouraging in the midst of all of this bad news. Notice that Joel is contemporary with the plague. He's not removed from this plague. 
either in its time or in its location. He is there. The food has been cut off before our eyes. But Joel shows his spiritual leadership. He writes, cry out to Yahweh in verse 14. But if you drop down to verse 19, you see that he exemplifies that. He leads Israel by example. He says, to you, O Yahweh, I cry. So the good news is that Israel has a godly, humble prophet who is calling them into sober agreement with God about their situation, the situation that is so desire, or dire that their sin is brought about. And verse 15 brings into view what's been coming all along here, and this is the thing that helps Israel understand just how dire the situation is. Alas for the day, the day of Yahweh is near, and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. So everything that's in view to this point is Israel, their sin, destruction. There's a locust plague because of their sin. And right on that, Joel says, think carefully because the day of the Lord is coming. So it's a devastating plague that's a cause for mourning. And it's something from which Israel needed to repent on a national message, on a national level. But Joel doesn't really focus on the plague. He moves his attention away from the plague to a point in time in the future. God knows Israel, and he wants them to know about a future event that is coming that is very, very significant, not only for them, but for the rest of the nations in the world. And so Joel takes some time in chapter 2 to describe what is coming. And so he moves away from this context of the locusts and all the stuff that's happening with them. And he begins to talk about a future military encounter that is coming. But it's interesting that when he talks about that future military encounter, he uses imagery from this present locust invasion right there in the same passage. And this is to help Israel see the connection between their present sin and a future judgment that's coming for Israel. And the first thing we need to say about this, this day is that it's coming. Chapter 2, verses 1 and the first part of 2. Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of Yahweh is coming. Surely it is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. It's coming. It's coming in a way that we, we can't ignore this. We need to know that it's coming. So this trumpet that is blown is a signaling horn. It tells those who hear it, to prepare for an engagement that's coming, most likely a military engagement. And notice that the warning is to Zion, to Jerusalem. These people are to tremble because the day is coming. So Jerusalem, Zion, Israel, they themselves are to tremble. So there's no innate, inherent security in being Jewish. They are to tremble over this. What characterizes that day is darkness and gloom, clouds and thick darkness. And we're going to see that the day that's describing is describing an army that is coming. And we'll see what God has prepared for that day. And we'll see that that is a very, very, very destructive entity. And God has a particular instrument in his hand, and we can see more about that in verses 3 through 10. And it's a very sobering picture for Israel in general, but Jerusalem in particular. As the dawn is spread over the mountains, so there is a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be again after it to the years of many generations. There's a uniqueness to this army. There's never been anything like it, nor there will be again. Very similar to the locust plague, if we remember back to chapter 1, verse 2. Has there been anything like this in your days or your father's days? So this army, there's never been anything like it in the same way that the locust plague, something like this, has never happened before. So God is using Judah's first-hand knowledge of this locust plague to help them understand and appreciate the gravity of the day of the Lord. This is no little deal. This is a big deal for Israel. And what's going to become very, very clear is that this is a very, very destructive entity and that Jerusalem has no chance of standing against this foe. If we look at verse 3, we see the destruction that it causes. A fire consumes before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but a desolate wilderness behind them, and nothing at all escapes them. Nothing at all escapes them. 
It's so destructive, this army, this entity, that it turns a beautiful promised land into a desolate wilderness. Again, this is a lot like what happened back in chapter 1, verse 7, where Joel writes that these locusts have made the vine a waste. So there's a lot of parallelism between what the locusts did and this coming day of the Lord and what will take place then. And you see the effect of this in verse 6 on the people. Before them, the people are in anguish and all their faces turn pale. Jerusalem is to be so fearful of this people that their skin loses its natural color. And for good reason, because what we're going to see is that this coming army is unstoppable. And we see that in verse 7. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like soldiers and each march in line nor do they deviate from their paths. You get the picture that there is this force that is advancing and that nothing impedes them at all. And they have one and only one objective, and that is to destroy Zion. And there's no terrain, there's no obstacle, there's no opponent that can deter them from this. And their movements are in perfect coordination with one another. If we look at verse 8, they do not crowd each other, they march everyone in his path and When they burst through the defenses, they do not break ranks. These people are well-trained. They know exactly what they're doing. They're very powerful. And they know how to go to war together. They know how to give one another the right spacing so that they can be effective in their task and their objective. And they know how to fight in their assigned lanes. There's not a single protective measure that Israel can take here that will stave off this enemy. And nothing will stop this enemy. There's no protection in verse 9 through the city itself or from the city wall or the privacy of the Jewish homes within the city. There's no protection whatsoever for them. This is not hard to visualize what God is getting at here. Israel will have been so sinful and has aroused God's wrath to such an extent that God has seen fit to send against them the greatest assembly of force that could ever be put together and that the world will ever see. How could Israel expect to survive this? How could this little nation of people expect to survive this? Everything about this people, this army, this force, when we look at its power, its fearsomeness, its invincibility, it almost appears that this chapter is all about destroying Israel, and up to this point it has been. But we want to remember what we said at the beginning, that the day of the Lord is about the Lord. And in verse 11, we see the Lord coming into view. In the midst of this terrible advancing army, this terrible advancing people, we see that God himself is in command of this. Verse 11, Yahweh utters his voice. Strong is he who carries out his word. Strong is the one who carries out the word of the Lord. So God remains the covenant-keeping God. He's chastened Israel with these locusts, and in the future he will begin to act to restore his people, and he will restore them to the kingdom promises that he has for them. And that's why we see what we do in verses 12 through 17. And it's very important to understand that in verses 12 through 17, Joel moves back to the present day, the day of the locust, and he calls Israel to repentance. He says in verse 12, and we see that he's saying repent today because he says, yet even now, in the time of Joel's writing, in the time of Joel's speaking, now return to me. With all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. God is saying, I'm I'm interested in your repentance. Because you know what's coming in the future, you need to repent. But I've seen your outward repentance before. I know exactly what that's like, and I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in something else. Restoration to me requires that you have a brokenness at a heart level, so rend your heart and not your garments. Tear out of your heart all the filth and idolatry that has been here to this day. And there's a motivation for this, and we see that motivation very, very clearly at the end of verse 13. This has everything to do with God and his desire to restore to himself the people that have been so unfaithful to him. Look at God's character as it's described in verse 13. He is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and he relents of evil. So we see that the day of the Lord is near, 
and it will be at the hands of a very, very destructive, invincible people. And this should motivate Israel to repent. And everything to this point has been about God's judgment of Israel, the judgment of the locust plague, the judgment of Israel in a day that is to come. But here is where the book takes a dramatic turn. And God begins to restore Israel. Starting with verse 18 of chapter 2, uh, Israel's repentance, their ability to repent, comes into view. This is a dramatic change. But God has not made his program for Israel dependent on them. This is a stubborn people. They won't repent on their own. It literally will take an act of God. And we're going to see that in the final phase of this, and that's the sort of the explanation of how it is that God accomplishes his day. And we're going to see that starting in verse 18, pretty much through the end of the book. This is where we see what God actually does to accomplish his day. And to see that, notice where all the activity is taking place in verse 18. Yahweh will be zealous for his land, and he will have pity on his people. Here's where we see God beginning to carry out his promise to Israel. His restoration of Judah starts with his affections for what is rightly his. His zeal for his land, his zeal for his people. And we're going to see pretty soon that God's Pity for Israel includes giving them a new heart. But his zeal for his land and his pity on his people first leads him to do something that we see starting in verse 20, and that's to defeat Israel's enemies. The first thing he does is he removes Israel's enemies. And we need to think back to the beginning of the chapter here, the posture of this enemy. It's running like war horses in verse 4, leaping on top of mountains in verse 5. Verse 9 tells us a number of things rushing on the city, running on the wall, climbing into the houses. First way God demonstrates his covenant love for Israel is by accomplishing his original design for the land. And that would be a land that is free from the polluting influence of a pagan people, an idolatrous people. And to do that, God is going to get rid of the invading army. I will remove the northern army far from you, and I will drive it into a parched and desolate land. So God's going to remove this people from the land so the land itself can be pure. And in verse 21 and following, God has a restored prosperity, a prosperity for the land, a prosperity for the livestock, and then a prosperity for the people themselves. We see it in verse 21. Do not fear, O land, rejoice and be glad, for Yahweh has done great things. There is a relief, there is a rejoicing in the land, the land that is once under duress with this massive nation and this people that came to him can rejoice and be glad. He has promises for the livestock. We see that in verse 18, how the beasts groan. That's back in chapter one. Now what God does here in verse 22 of chapter two, do not fear beasts of the field for the pastures of the wilderness have turned green. The tree has borne its fruit. The fig tree and the vine tree have yielded in full So the beasts, the cattle, the livestock, they have no cause for fear of thirst or starvation or anything else. They can rest and be well. Those things are more minor. And God moves on to the people themselves, and he talks about their material provision, their material prosperity that's going to be restored. And God says in verses 23 through 26, Be glad in Yahweh your God, for he has given you the early rain. The early and the latter rains is before, verse 24, the threshing floors will be full of grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and new oil. Then I will make up for you for the years of the swarming locust, the creeping locust, dripping locust, gnawing locust. Verse 26, you will have plenty to eat and you will be satisfied and you will praise the name of Yahweh your God who has dealt wondrously with you. Who's doing the work here? Well, God is doing the work. You look at every one of those verbs and God is doing those things. I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. So God has given the rain which causes the threshing floor to be full of grain and the vats to overflow with wine and oil. And God makes up for what the locusts have taken. And at the end of verse 26, God hints at what's coming next. He says, you will praise the name of Yahweh your God. And that's exactly what takes place in verses 28 and 29. That is that God begins to restore Israel, and he does it at a heart level. 
It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all of mankind. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, even on the male and female servants. I will pour out my spirit in those days. We look carefully at verse 28 that God gives us a time marker that's very helpful for us. He says, it will come about after this. We need to ask ourselves, what is this? When we read backwards and we can find out what this is. It's after God has driven out the army. It's after he's restored the land. He's after he's relieved the beast. And it's after he has given Israel their material prosperity back. With as much material blessing as God pours out on the land and on the livestock and on the people, the people are still in the same spiritual condition. What they need is God to pour out his spirit on all those people. And the evidence of his work is what will be seen in these people. The sons and the daughters are going to be prophesying. So God has restored the land. He's restored them materially. And then he has restored them spiritually. And then this is what God intended all along. That he would have a people for his own name. People eager for his own glory. A people eager to worship him. A people who were so disobedient and so evil in Old Testament times that he had to send a locust plague to devour their crops. A people that in the future days from now, he will have to discipline them with the great and terrible day of the Lord, with the time of Jacob's trouble. But he will restore a portion of those people to himself because he will give them a new heart, a heart that allows them to worship him the way that he intended for them to worship him. And so that's the first piece of this that's really, really encouraging for the people of Israel. But there's another way in which God puts himself on display in the day of the Lord. And he does that by bringing his just judgment to the nations. And we see that in chapter 3. And the first thing that he does really at the end of chapter 2 is he foretells that starting in verse 30 or so. And what we see is that God foretells the, the coming day of the Lord to the nations with great atmospheric and geological activity. And Joel doesn't go into a lot of detail here, but there are other places in our Bibles where we can go where God gives us that information, and it's very, very helpful. We'll see this soon in our Revelation series on Sunday mornings. Chapter 6, verse 14, the sky will be split apart like a scroll. God is going to take the atmosphere above us and divide it. And that will be a sign to the nations that the day of the Lord is coming. Joel tells us here in verses 30 and 31a, I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So you have this blood and fire and columns of smoke. You have this Massive, massive devastation of the earth itself. There is burning. There is bloodshed on the earth. It is a terrible, terrible, terrible time. The sun is turning into darkness and the moon into blood. There's atmospheric changes that that affect our ability to see the sun for what it is. That will shield the sun's strong rays from us. It will change the appearance of the moon as well. What is normally white will appear to us as red because of all of the smoke and fire that is in the sky. This is the outpouring of God's wrath on the earth in preparation for the day of the Lord. And these are markers that are telling us that God's judgment in the day of the Lord is coming. And these occur before the actual day of the Lord. And the reason why we know that is because of the end of verse 31. God says all of this will take place before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So before God assembles the nations for his judgment, he gives and he warns the nations of his impending judgment on them. And he does that by bringing these massive, massive changes, changes in the sky and changes on the land. But in the midst of all of that, you see God's merciful character coming through. He is zealous for his own name, but he's also merciful. Verse 32, it will come about that whoever calls upon the name of Yahweh will be delivered. Whoever, even in the outpouring of his judgment on these nations, God is merciful to save those who will call upon his name. Isn't that kind? 
So there are some visible indicators that divine judgment is coming. But Joel also tells us that this judgment is going to take place in one location. And God himself does the assembling of the nations into that location. And we see the way he summons those people together in verses 2 through 17. Verse 2, I will gather all the nations and bring them to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Probably a large, flat area of land somewhere to the east, northeast, southeast of Jerusalem, somewhere over there. In verse 7, behold, I am going to arouse them. Arouse. God is going to cause the nations to rise and move to this location. They will mobilize and head for this location. And he will do this with a summons. And we see that summons in verse 9. Proclaim this to the nations. Prepare a war. Rouse the mighty men. Let all the soldiers draw near. Let them come up. This is a worldwide summons. See the words, the nations? These aren't just Israel's immediate neighbors. This is the nations. And look at who God is bringing. He is bringing the soldiers here in verse 9. But he's bringing others as well when we look at verse 10. And this is amazing. The breadth of people that are drawn into this valley is amazing. Bleat, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am a mighty man. This is talking about two different kinds of people here. The people who use plowshares are farmers. And then God mentions weak people. So you have these farmers being drawn together. You have weak people, people that are not normally powerful. They are drawn into the battle, the same thing. They're drawn into this place. Joel doesn't provide a lot of information as to what them motivates them to come, but we don't need to know that. We know that God is sovereignly working in all of these different people to assemble them together in one place where he can pour out his judgments. And we see that in verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of Yahweh is near in the valley of decision. So we already mentioned it in verse 9. All of these people that are coming, but this will be a gathering of a massive quantity of people. God has gathered them and we see why he does that. He gives the reason for that. And there's a number of places where he gives the reason. We're going to start in verse 2. I will enter into judgment there on behalf of my people and my inheritance Israel, whom they, the nations, have scattered among the nations. And they've divided up my land. Notice all of this takes place then. When is this? This is after all that's described at the end of chapter 2, after the foretelling of the signs of the great tribulation and the time of Israel's trouble. That's when that will happen. Now we look at why, starting in verse 2. They've scattered Israel among the nations. God had a land for them called the Promised Land, and the nations scattered Israel among the nations. They've also divided up the Promised Land that God refers to as His own land, my land. In verse 3, we see how they treat God's people. They cast lots for the people. They trade young boys for prostitutes and girls for wine. This is horrible. In verse 5, particularly, three nations, the immediate surrounding nations, Tyre, Sidon, and Philistia, they stole the temple treasures. And the people of Tyre sold the Jews into slavery to the Greeks. So these nations, they abused the land, they abused God's temple treasures, they abused God's people. That is why God is doing this. And we look at this and we realize that this particular account doesn't describe very closely what God does in his judgment of them. But God does tell us through Joel in verse 12 and in verse 13, I will sit to judge the nations, put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe, come tread for the winepress is full, the vats overflow for their wickedness is great. And the language and the picture that's created by this language is very, very helpful. This is harvest language. Wine press, vats, this is talking about a harvest. And when you see this, you know you're talking about a judgment. The wine press is where the squeezing takes place. And this squeezing is God's judgment. There's a great pressure that will be applied to these people. And the wine press is the device that holds what is to be pressed. And the vats, this is what holds the extract from the pressing process. The vats are overflowing, which means there's a lot of judgment. 
There's a lot of pressing taking place here, and there's not enough containers to hold it all. So this is a very concentrated, very comprehensive judgment on the nations. It's the most rigorous, decisive, permanent judgment this world will ever see. And God is doing this because their wickedness is great. And the outcome in verse 17 is that you will know that I, Yahweh, your God, am dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. So Jerusalem will be holy and strangers will pass through it no more. God wants to restore his people to himself. He wants to restore the land, redeem the land back to himself, and strangers will pass through it no more. And we see the last word for Judah here near the end. And the last word is that they have material blessing. Verse 18, In that day the mountains will drip with sweet wine, and the hills will flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah will flow with water and a spring will go out from the house of Yahweh to water the valley of Shittim. God's covenant-keeping nature compels him to lavish blessing upon blessing, blessing after blessing on those who he has restored to himself. That's what God does. That's what is in front of remnant Israel, is abundant, lavish blessing on the land that God has for them. He is faithful to his covenant promise to his people. This is a big deal. And you see what he has in store for other nations. He has desolation for those people in verse 19. Egypt will become a waste. Edom will become a desolate wilderness because of the violence done to the sons of Judah in whose land they have shed innocent blood. God had for them to be a chastening tool in their hand, a hand that he would use to, to chasten Israel. But they went far beyond what God had for them to do. They shed innocent blood. So God has blessing in store for his people and he has a chastening and a desolation in store for those who have done violence to the sons of Judah. So what we see here is that God is faithful to his promise to his people. He tells Abraham in Genesis 12 through 15, I am going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. The nations will be blessed through you. And there are specific promises to the land and all Abraham needs to do is obey our Old Testament is full of stories. We've seen this all the way through our 66 books to this point that Israel is largely unfaithful to all of that. But we see mercy, kindness, faithfulness to God, to his own character, to restore his people. So we have to ask ourselves what that means for us today. And to do that, I want us to turn to Romans chapter 11. And let's look at verses 24 and 25. And I want us to keep in mind the, the picture here of Two different kind of olive trees, the cultivated one and the wild one. And we know this. The cultivated olive tree represents Israel and the wild olive tree, often some desolate place, scraggly and dying, represents the rest of the world, us Gentiles. And what we need to see here is how kind God is that through the disobedience of unbelieving, disobedient Israel, he brings about salvation for people who are part of this wild, wretched olive tree. I'll start in verse 24. If you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will those who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? God is merciful and kind. He is going to restore Israel. You see restoration taking place there. But there's also a description there of us that is very, very helpful for the Gentile. They're grafted contrary to nature. We're naturally born into this wretched, scraggly, dying, dead, barely alive bush somewhere out in the middle of the desert. God removes us from that plant and grafts us contrary to our nature into a verdant, lush, well-cultivated olive tree. And there's a warning for the Gentile in verse 25. I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed about this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. 
That partial hardening is these branches that are broken off that gives opportunity for those other wild branches to be grafted in. God says, do not be wise in your own estimation. God is mercifully saving the Gentile until the day that he will restore the Jew to himself. We're in a window of human history where God is mercifully saving Gentiles to himself. It's a room full of people who are believers here tonight. I'm so thankful you're here. Believers, what we need to do is humbly thank God for his kindness to save us. This is a powerful picture for us. We see what God does to save Israel. But in the midst of all of that, he's leaving opportunity for the Gentile. So humbly thank God for his kindness to save you. And then live your life in faithful obedience to him. Depend upon his grace every day for what you need to be obedient to him. It is hard to be obedient apart from his grace. You can't do it. For those that don't know Christ, repent today. You have no other opportunity for salvation. You must embrace God's one and only design for your salvation. And that is through recognizing the work that Christ does in the place of all of those who do not deserve him and submit to his lordship of your life. Let's pray. Lord, I'm thankful. Thankful for this book. Thankful that many, many, many centuries ago, you brought something to a people that showed them the extent of their sin before you. And you kindly, mercifully told them about an event that is coming in the future. And you warned them about it. And you exhorted them, you admonished them. You kindly told them through a faithful prophet to repent. Lord, I'm thankful for your grace and your kindness to the believer today. That you have given us new life. Life in which we can walk in newness of life. You've granted us grace to do that. I pray for us that we would do that today. That we would have a renewed gratitude and renewed joy for what you've done for us. Knowing, Lord God, how kind you are to your people. Lord, I pray for us this week, whatever is ahead of us. Lord, whether it's challenges at work or challenges at home. Challenges with resources or our health or anything else. Lord, that we would seek to be obedient to you and faithful to you in the things that you have for us so that we could praise your name and be better ambassadors for you in the days to come. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.